Thanks everyone for making it back from lunch. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. My name is Will Higby. I'm a professor of film studies at the University of Exeter. Um, and I was asked by Jamie Chambers, one of the organisers of the conference and editors of the Film Education Journal, um, to um, sort of convene a panel on global perspectives on film education, um, which um, I was delighted to do. So thank you very much to Jamie and um, to CIFEC. Is that the guy? Got that right? For, um, for the invitation, thanks to the University of Exeter. Um, Exeter, Edinburgh, slip of the tongue, sorry. Um, and most of all, thank you to um, our three esteemed panellists. I think we're incredibly fortunate to have um, such a great range of um, experience, talent and insight on, on the panel. Um, I'm going to be chairing this session um, and speaking for as little as possible. The idea is that we will have, um, we'll have sort of initial um, presentations of five to ten minutes from each of our panellists, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Um, and um, then there'll be a, a, an open discussion for around 20 minutes to 25 minutes between the panellists and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. So those burning questions, if you could hold those for the, for the final part of the discussion, um, because the idea is that we, that we open up the discussion between our three panellists. So. Um, I think the, um, the, the aim of this, this panel is to think about different ways of approaching film education and training. There'll be a particular focus on film schools here, um, but also thinking about innovative um, and alternative strategies and perspectives in both national and transnational contexts for, um, for, for, for film education. Um, we're thinking in particular, um, I think in this session, around possibilities for um, transnational collaboration and um, intercultural exchange, um, ideas around solidarity, um, and also the ethical implications in um, film education. I know this is something that Meta will be talking about a bit later, but I think this is probably a theme that we'll come back to. The ethical implications in teaching, um, the ethics of practice and um, how such ethics um, in film education might actually affect um, the, the outcomes of the, the, the work that's produced. So um, also I think we'll be looking at questions in, of, of diversity, agency and, and what offering a global perspective might actually mean. It kind of brings me back to uh, the great Egyptian filmmaker Youssef Shaheen's comment that um, I'm in the first world, the third world for me is the UK and Europe, you know, I've been here for thousands and thousands of years, so what are we talking about in terms of perspective and when we talk about global perspectives on film education? Um, I'm going to introduce each of the panellists and then um, the, the idea that we've had is to, is to, is to open this out from some gem more general observations, um, coming first from Rod, then thinking about um, this in a national context with, with Gaston and finally um, thinking possibly about this idea of transnational solidarity um, with Meta. So um, the first of our panellists is Rod Stoneman. He is um, or is a Professor Emeritus of Film and Digital Media at the Houston School um, of Film and Digital Media from um, Galway, the National University of Ireland. Um, prior to his role at the Houston um, School, Rod was Chief Executive of the Irish Film Board um, through the 1990s till 2003. Um, and also he was, um, before that, Deputy Commissioning Editor for the Independent Film and Video Department at Channel 4. So Rod has a, a, a wealth of experience um, in areas of production and policy and as well as um, working in academic research through the various publications that he's made in, um, in, in relation to research and practice and film education. Um, our second panellist, um, and we're delighted that he's been able to um, join us all the way from Burkina Faso, and also serving as a member of the, the jury at the, uh, at the Edinburgh International Film Festival is Gaston Cabaret. Um, Gaston will be familiar to many of you, I'm sure, through um, his work. I don't think it's um, 
um, you know, overstating to say that um, he is one of the um, most important figures in um, West African and African cinema, not only from the films that he's, he's um, directed. Many of you will know uh, films such as Wend Kuni from 1985, Zanboko from 1988, and Badyam from 1997. Um, so his, his filmography speaks for itself, um, but also as um, someone who has worked in the area of promoting African cinema um, in a national and transnational context, both as the director of the, um, of the Centre Nation, National de la Cinématographie um, in Burkina Faso through the late 70s until the late 80s, and as the president of um, the Pan-African Federation of um, Filmmakers from 1985 to 1997. Um, in particular, another of his um, achievements and another part of Gaston's legacy is um, the work that he's been doing since 2003 with the Imagine Institute. He founded um, the Imagine Institute in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, which is a really innovative space for training and development for um, young African filmmakers, um, which, but which brings together a range of experience and um, global perspectives on the possibilities for um, not just training film professionals, but also promoting cultural diversity and um, allowing in particular young African filmmakers the, um, the means, but also the training and the understanding to develop their own stories and, and create distinctive voices for, um, um, for sort of the, the future of African cinema. So um, Gaston will today be talking, I think in particular, about um, his work with the, the Imagine Institute. And our final panellist is Mette Hjort, um, who again is, I've been a great admirer of Mette Hjort's work for, for many, many years. She's um, an incredibly important figure in, um, in film studies um, as a discipline. Uh, She's currently a professor of film studies at the University of Copenhagen, but she's also um, soon to take up a post as professor of humanities and the dean of arts at Hong Kong Baptist University. So kind of going back to Hong Kong where she'd worked for a long time. Um, she's a leading scholar and researcher in film studies around a range of um, topics and issues. In particular, I think there's a, there's a real focus in her work on questions of theorising national cinema and transnational cinema. I'm thinking of edited collections like Cinema and Nation from 2000 or her co-edited collection with Duncan Petrius, Cinema of Small Nations. She's also looked specifically at Danish cinema in a national and transnational context, um, you know, with a great title of uh, Small Nations Response to Globalisation, which I uh, often refer to. And also she's done pioneering work in relation to theorising transnational cinema, which is something that's, um, you know, quite close to um, my research interests. Um, She's also worked on film education, two volumes on the education of the filmmaker and also most recently work on cinema and human rights. So um, we have a really fantastic panel with us uh, today. The Meta will be speaking on talent development through collaboration between a specific case study, I suppose, between the Danish Film Institute and the Film Lab in Palestine, focusing in particular on solidarity and ethics in the context of transnational talent development. So we've got a whole range of things that we're going to get to. I am going to stop talking now because I'd like the panellists to speak and we'll begin with um, Rod who's going to be um, giving some observations from his um, various experiences in different uh, national global contexts on film education. I'll pass over to you Rod. Uh, well, uh, you'd be spared a PowerPoint from me, that's all right. Um, Yes, I was hoping uh, within the contained uh, 10 minutes to talk a little bit about um, training and education and the uh, connotations of those two uh, terms in, in, in terms of film, um, under, film, study, film studies and filmmaking. Um, drawing on experiences uh, at I I Imagine uh, in Wakadugu um, and also workshops um, called Med Film Factory in Amman in Jordan. Um, of course, obviously, in a way, uh, these things, uh, you know, earlier this morning people were talking about the autobiographical. They also uh, connect with um, working uh, in the Houston School of Film in, um, in, in Galway. Um, and uh, I suppose a starting point would be 
um, the, the, a book called Educating Filmmakers uh, with Duncan Petrie. And uh, Duncan did the uh, sensible part of the book, uh, a lot of uh, oral history and a lot of analysis about the setting up of mostly European and then American film schools, um, and mostly after World War II. And uh, I, I contributed um, a um, slightly, well, I mean, it, it, the, the second section of the book is called Provocations, and um, that, that's probably accurate. But both bits of the book um, share the same concerns about the way that the initial phase of a lot of uh, training in film schools uh, was a balanced diet, if I can use that term, um, where filmmakers uh, had art and art history and literature and cultural training, um, some degree perhaps of ethics or politics, um, creativity and imagination and curiosity um, encouraged uh, dissent and um, uh, criticality. Um, and in the last 15 to 20 years, there has been something like a consistent shift towards a more craft-based approach in training uh, uh, people as filmmakers. Um, uh, an instrumentalization, if you like, of that whole area whereby it's training for the industry. In fact, um, I was with a colleague over there at a, a production studies conference in Bristol a couple of years ago, and I was chairing a, a, a panel session um, of uh, production companies, and one of them used the phrase, uh, but someone said, what do you want from students? They said, we want them to be industry ready which somehow for me I couldn't but think of oven-ready chickens and um, other pre-processed um, culinary, uh, best avoided um, culinary products. Um, and I think that, uh, I mean, we could talk about why I think being ready for uh, the industry in the state it is, the cultural industries in the state they are, um, is a problem. I mean, how long have you got? But. Um, uh, you know, at least uh, uh, I think we, we need to think about ways in which um, people are, of course, brought to a place where they can earn a living, but um, are also taught to challenge and change or to have alternative forms of production um, as a possibility in that area. Um, one of the problems about, uh, you know, the, the industry, without even putting, it's like... Um, um, you know, without even saying the Western industry, is its insularity, is the um, level of uh, enclosure and ignorance about, um, you know, other parts uh, of the globe and what films um, may be made um, there. Um, and, and, and that insularity is part of, I mean, there's globalization on the one hand, but um, the neoliberal epoch has depoliticized our relationship with um, the south of the world. Um, and obviously by uh, sort of autobiographical again, but the formative experience was in the early years of Channel 4 when it was still a television station. And, um, you know, independent film and video tried very hard to develop um, something that Isaacs originally said about radical pluralism. Um, and uh, to, uh, through working with the workshops and low-budget fiction and political documentary and um, feature films from what we call the third world, experiment and a sort of intellectual dimension for television, tried to um, enhance radical pluralism with a key... Uh, uh, strategy being direct speech, where unheard voices had access to the public domain um, with a, I wouldn't say without mediation, but with a minimum of mediation, so that a community of interest could say how it saw the world directly. And I saw that as spanning, uh, you know, a, a, a film from uh, West Africa uh, or uh, Latin America alongside a political documentary or a piece of personal artisanal filmmaking from different parts. Or even here, Leith, that we did a thing with Indians in Leith. And, um, um, up the syringes on the stairs in Pilton. Video for Pilton? These were, those were access programs, but I saw, you know, access programs are made under the control, with professional filmmakers collaborating, but under the control of the community. And um, I don't, I, I saw a degree of continuity between working, I've given a couple of Scottish examples, and uh, what we were trying to do in other parts of the world. To basically counter representations imposed from outside with Pers perspectives and uh, uh, perceptions um, from inside. 
And the terms of engagement, I think Mette is going to go into this rather more, but the terms of engagement um, with the southern part of the globe have to be very clearly thought through. They have to be on the basis of respect and reciprocity. And we need to think how we think. We need, like, you know, anthropologists are very good at reflexivity because they've been such bad boys in previous uh, decades uh, and the way they've understood the world. So we have to think reflexively and morally and politically about that relationship and avoid well-intentioned but subtle imposition. I mean, we could even talk about words because I've always thought, I live in Ireland, you know, for a while, and uh, I always thought that the way that Britain or British people use the word Europe is actually in a subtle way a contribution to the mess that we stroke they are in, in that, you know, it, you can't talk about Europe. Where else are we now? And if you look at the film festival um, with one hand, uh, you know, there are sections, the best of British, okay? American dreams, okay? European perspectives, European classics, world perspectives. What's world? Yeah. What's this world thing? We're in the world. There's no other. It, the world is used as a word about the other. You know, world music is, um, you know, a little bit of Mexican salsa or something. Oh, Gentinian salsa. Um, so, you know, the way words work are part of unconscious and invisible ideologies. We talk about human rights, and I did an interview for a book by Mete with Gaston, and he said, well, uh, come on about human rights. I mean, often the terms of human rights are people flying down to Africa from, you know, a university course in Paris or New York and uh, saying we're going to launch a campaign on FGM or some such. And, you know, it's all well-intentioned, but it still is a power relation uh, from the north uh, to the south. And actually, if we're talking about human rights, they didn't start in 1718, 1798 or even 1948 with Eleanor Roosevelt. You could well look at the Charter of Mande, which was in Mali in 1236, and uh, you know, included Article 16 is a sort of set of suggestions for regulating human relationships. Article 16, women, comma, apart from their everyday occupations, comma, should be associated with all our managements. That's the Charter of Mandate in 1235. We're just getting back to it <laughs> um, at the moment. So, you know, these perspectives need to be inside a framework which is thought through. Filmmaking is taught in a context, production is taught in relation to critical analysis and vice versa, so that uh, critical analysis and academic courses have some articulation with practice-based work, the plasticity of the image. And, you know, obviously, the starting point for me is here in Edinburgh, you know, the screen event in 1976 and 1977 set out a whole theoretical agenda um, which has developed but um, has not gone away. Um, I'd like to end by suggesting that thinking critically about production and vice versa um, will actually, with a bit of luck, lead to something around the politics of representation, which didn't come up so much this morning. Um, the, the, the political implications of aesthetic decisions. Um, I can't resist but uh, quote Goddard, one has to. Um, the morality of the tracking shot, which actually stole from someone else, but the morality of the tracking shot and film as a thinking machine is in Eastward de Cinema. And uh, just in time, one extraordinary phrase of um, the late years of Roland Barthes. The, I can't do the French. So the truth of a text is not the truth that it says. It is, paradoxically, the truth of its form. Now, I think that's an overstatement, but it talks about, you know, let's look at the signifier and how the signifiers work. And if we're talking about film education or film training, you know, we have to begin by looking at the politics of its representation. And in both Imagine and in uh, MFF, there have been different ways of trying to do this that I haven't got a lot of time to go into. But here's one thing. In February, there was a, uh, a workshop on sound in Imagine in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. And... Um, talking uh, from Larry Side, two people from Larry Siders involved in the School of Sound, talking with um, um, young filmmakers about how they use sound, and not just a naturalistic, invisible, uh, uh, y you know, I mean, there's sort of... Uh, Eisler Adorno critique of music in sound and, and, and naturalistic sound and just setting an exercise which led to remarkable ro results because the people that we were working with, I mean, they've got something to say. I remember when some National Film School films were shown to an Italian editor, he walked out of the screening and said, but all the films are about nothing. 
Well, you don't get that in uh, um, parts of the um, in, in the South because there is an urgency. There is some, clearly something to say, and the form of which to say it. Here, I finish by saying the exercise was to say um, make a three or four minute film, six shots, only two can be in close up, and use the sound to actually direct our attention around the other four wide shots. And the results were really unexpected and imaginative. Now, they might go on doing work for other film companies which involve the traditional industrial use of sound, but they might remember, um, you know, the space for using sound differently and bringing it um, into focus. I've gone on too long. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rod. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, Gaston. You. Um, so we'll have questions, as I said, l later on. Um, so I'll hand over now to, to Gaston Cabaret, who's going to um, speak about his experiences of um, founding and running the, um, the Imagine Institute. Thank you. Well, you can sit there, stay here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, good evening <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> Uh, not yet uh, completely evening, but uh, for me, <laughs> it's almost. <laughs> um, I would say that um, uh, it's a big uh, chance for me to be here, to hear all of the people that uh, who have already spoken uh, this morning because it nurtures my, my thoughts and uh, because I am in the middle of a road, uh, the school um, road was speaking about uh, started 15 years ago. And now I feel that we are uh, in a kind of crossroads where we have to define again um, the philosophy uh, or at least the, uh, the the, the way that we are continue, we are going to continue training filmmakers, but also enlarging the film education because we are not only doing workshops, uh, as he, he said, but also we are uh, organizing symposium, seminars, and uh, round tables on different subjects, uh, subjects related to culture uh, because uh, just to say a few words about my own itinerary, I was studying history uh, and uh, I was not supposed to become a filmmaker. Uh, it happened and then uh, I realized that uh, telling stories is uh, as uh, uh, much important as uh, reporting history. Uh, but I still believe that history is a, um, a vehicle, important vehicle to understand uh, our uh, experience uh, in the long duration. And uh, for people who have been colonized, you know, uh, in Africa, we needed to uh, repossess ourselves, you know, to see the, the world through our own eyes. And uh, for me, it was completely intimately, intimately related to the, the, our capacity of uh, reconnecting the traits of our imagination. That was very important to, to my eyes. And uh, then I started making films, but I felt that uh, maybe... Uh, to make one, two, three, four films, and maybe more, uh, I was competing with another, another um, uh, uh, time line. That was the fact that Africa is completely living in the deficit of self-representation on the screen, the big screen, or in the television, and I can see uh, the, 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 the children and the youth completely uh, invaded uh, in their minds by uh, stories, uh, 
uh, an imagination coming from abroad. Of course, we need to be open to other, to the diversity, but you cannot live uh, without expressing yourself, you know. And that, uh, uh, that idea brought me to create this school. Very uh, simply, I said, well, we have to organize the transmission of something to, to, to um, uh, I would say, to strengthen uh, the ability of uh, the Africans to tell their own stories because we need badly that, you know. Otherwise, we, we shall continue uh, losing uh, the, the, the real, um, the real uh, 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 capacity in, uh, in, uh, in um, determining our own destinies, you know. It's uh, something that I felt very, very inside. Then I didn't ask anything. I didn't create any dossier to say I want to establish a film school. I just started to build a place, you know. I made uh, 27,000 concrete bricks and I started building. I said it will be a place where some filmmakers, the elders will come and, and uh, they will meet uh, young filmmakers to share you know, the uh, ideals, uh, their stories to discuss about uh, narratives, about aesthetics. And uh, because in Africa, of course, we do not, we haven't yet developed uh, the critic, film critic, you know, according to our own, uh, uh, should I say, cause or whatever you might name it. And for me, it was also very urgent that we are able to to um, to see how the the Africans in their diversity are addressing the issue of storytelling. You know, because there are uh, it is a a very very long tradition of storytelling. How cinema could uh, match with this long tradition. And myself, my first movie, uh, I wrote it as a tale, a modern tale. And I tried to, to of course, use the cinematic language, but not, uh, you know, uh, taking uh, completely aside the rules of storytelling in my own uh, culture. So that was uh, very, uh, in a pragmatic, pragmatic way, how I was addressing the issue of film training, education, and so on. And um, I was not supposed to create a school. I did it because it came from different steps that I, I have taken. And uh, today, for me, after 21 years without making my own thing because I was completely absorbed by the school, uh, I am questioning myself what should be the next step, you know? Uh, because today, uh, I don't know how to put it in English, but we say in French, TNT, Television Numérique Terrestre. Maybe if I translate it, digital. yeah, digital television is there. And in my country, where we used to have only three channels, today we can have 14. What is going to be in those uh, uh, channels, you know? So it's a new environment coming where it will be even more necessarily uh, for us to tell our own stories, no matter the formats and so on. So we have already um, uh, organized one workshop uh, for uh, uh, more than 60 people coming from different cities of Burkina. 
uh, with the people of Ouagadougou, the capital city that is known because of FESPACO and so on. And we are trying to create uh, what I call the independent creators of contents. You know, it's a new, uh, a new um, way of addressing the issue. Uh, what are we going to tell about ourselves? How are we going to portray our reality? What would be uh, the the uh, the possibility for the youth in Africa uh, to uh, not to be disqualified of the 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 writing of its own story, you know, in order to avoid that they cross the deserts and the seas, risking their life because they want to come uh, to uh, to the west while the same resources invested in this risky trip could be completely productive productive if they stay on place you know so question of creation imagination storytelling storytelling are related to the this uh, could i say um, the way that the Africans see themselves in the new future, what would be their uh, their uh, their uh, place? What role are they going to play? And it's very important, particularly because also with the failures of our different gov different governments. We need really the the um, how you call that the the le, le, la société civil society yeah to to take more uh, more um, uh, action you know in order to uh, to participate to the the right ruling. You know, because the ruling classes, the classic ones, have failed completely, and now we need other ways of addressing the issues of development. You know, in Africa. So, I am just a filmmaker that believes that uh, uh, who believes that we 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 have to play, uh, even in a very modest way, our own role trying to improve the situation and particularly to say to the youth in Africa that it is not a fate to be born in Africa. Thank you very much, Gaston. Um, okay, so we're going to hand over to Meta who has a, um, a presentation that she's going to do. I'll use the mic. Um, I want to thank Jamie for the invitation, Will for the very generous introduction. Um, I want to thank Rod and also Gaston. I was at Imagine as a result of my friendship with Rod in 2011 and 2013 and being at Imagine was an absolutely extraordinary um, experience and it's an absolute delight to be on the panel together with these um, two uh, wonderful people. I want to talk a little bit about transnational um, talent development. Um, I think that the different um, uh, initiatives that are being set up in transnational ways in the area of talent development um, are very hopeful um, but there are a lot of um, issues to discuss um, as well. Um, I think they're hopeful uh, because oftentimes the um, amount of money that's involved is actually quite limited um, and yet the focus is very often on uh, what moving images actually can do, why they matter, the cultural value, the public value of film. So in a sense, if we think back to what um, Rod said about being industry ready, um, I find that when I go to these different sites, 
sites where transnational talent development is occurring, what I connect with um, in a very powerful way is the um, importance of film, um, the potential of film to contribute to um, sustainable um, societies, to the building of a good society, and so on. So these are some of the reasons why I'm very um, interested in transnational talent development. Um, one thing that I'm um, trying to think about is um, this idea of transnational talent development in the context of production studies, because often the transnational talent development involves the making of a film. And I have a very strong intuition um, about the connection between the artistic and cultural values of actual filmic outcomes, the connection between that and getting the context of production set up in a way that actually stands up to ethical scrutiny. So I would like to claim um, taking philosopher Beres Gort's um, ethicist position about um, value in film. I'd like to claim that artistic um, value is not just a matter of looking at a filmic text um, and um, seeing whether um, merited responses actually are being encouraged in the text so that there's a link between ethical value and artistic value. I think we need to go back into the context of production as well. So um, I'm going to point you in a the direction of a particular project in Palestine, which I think demonstrates the way in which getting the context of production right in connection with transnational talent development yields better work. Um, so um, I should just keep an eye on the time here. Um, this is part of um, trying to think about a small nation, Denmark, its role outside of Denmark. For years I focused on Denmark, inside of Denmark, um, and then I suddenly realized that Denmark was involved in all sorts of things outside of Denmark with film. I became very interested in that. Um, and so I've looked at um, Denmark's involvement in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in um, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, um, but also in the Middle East, um, where it was involved, for example, in setting up a regional film school, Arab Institute of Film, survived for two years, successor institution in Lebanon, Screen Institute Beirut. The National Film School of Denmark actually has as a required program of its documentary film section that students have to go to the Middle East and make a film um, as a one-woman band in collaboration with um, artists in the Middle East and so on and so forth. So there are all these different strands. Um, and then in terms of the Middle East, the most recent strand is the collaboration between the Danish Film Institute and um, Ramallah in Palestine um, and the creation of Film Lab Palestine in 2014 in collaboration with the Danish House in Ramallah. So that is where I'm going to take you. Um, in connection with this idea of um, solidarity and um, what it actually yields in terms of a cinematic works. Um, I was drawn into um, uh, this by the uh, Danish Film Institute, my good and wonderful um, uh, colleague and friend Charlotte Giese, who is known to some of you, um, asked me um, to do a mapping exercise together with a local Palestinian researcher, Hulud Badawi, uh, focusing on the provision of film education broadly construed, ranging from audience building through to actual production initiatives in Gaza the West Bank um, and East Jerusalem. And then the remit was um, during um, Days of Cinema, which is a festival run by Film Lab Palestine, to then go together with Khulut and Shaloda also um, to present the uh, findings of this report to the Minister of Culture and the Minister of Higher Education. And I just mentioned that very briefly in order to evoke all of the different ways in which solidarity actually can find expression in connection with transnational talent development. So when we're looking at transnational talent development, I think we need to be asking questions like what sorts of models are involved? Um, what are the values that are driving the different initiatives? Um, and who gains? Um, does 
one party gain more than the other? How do we um, how do we deal with um, inequities? And also, of course, we need to ask about um, challenges and how um, they are being dealt with. Uh, one thing that I'm coming across is uh, the idea of transnational talent development as being really, really important in terms of network formation, uh, creating um, transnational networks. But I'll just leave um, that for now. So I already mentioned that. Uh, we need to keep the level of uh, policy in mind. Um, so, you know, we go all the way up to uh, the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and we find policies like this with very particular orientations. And what I'm finding is that um, on the ground, what really matters is, um, is, is solidarity, um, shared values, and what people do is they sort of access pots of money that are made possible at the higher level by this kind of policy formation and then on the ground one sort of pretty much forgets about um, about the policy level and does what uh, one thinks is important in terms of the public value of film transnational talent development um, and and so on um, when one looks at the policy level, one could start to worry about issues of soft power. Um, we need to have that on the radar. But um, again, um, in terms of the work that I've been doing, what I find is that on the ground, what really is in play is shared values, an immense emphasis on um, local initiative, voice, and what Rod Elfand calls um, direct um, speech, and an enormous emphasis, at least as an ideal, as a regulative idea on partnerships of equals and a very, very sustained um, and committed um, um, attempt to actually figure out how to create robust partnerships of equals, where learning um, in this transnational process is genuinely bi-directional and not just on paper. Um, and um, and also what matters there on the ground is producing works that speak for themselves. I spoke to Mohammed Swaid um, on Skype in connection with Screen Institute Beirut. Mohammed is a, a producer and filmmaker located in Lebanon. And he says, look, yes, every time money comes here to the Middle East, people are worried about soft power. The only way to deal with that worry is to produce uh, tangible um, outcomes that, that, that speak for themselves. So that's um, something that we can think about as well. Um, I have um, a little bit of time left, just if, uh, I think I've got three and a half minutes left, yeah, um, to talk about uh, Film Lab Palestine. So, um, established in 2014 with a tiny pot of money from the Danish um, Film Institute and then more recently the ND, uh, NGO International Media Support. Um, and um, the person who initiated all of this is Hannah Atala, um, a Palestinian uh, filmmaker who had been running um, production um, um, camps in um, the refugee camps in um, Jordan. Um, and more recently, Brigitte uh, Boula has um, been brought in to help with the administrative side of running Film Lab Palestine. And she is uh, Lebanese and Egyptian um, and, um, and very, very deeply uh, committed to uh, to Ramallah and um, and uh, Film Lab Palestine. Um, so um, Film Lab Palestine does a number of different things. So in terms of film education, it's all the way over um, um, in the direction of audience building through the running of the festival, but also getting school children in to see films. Um, all the way over there to the other end of the spectrum where it is about uh, production um, and um, uh, skill sets and um, creating the basis for something like a film industry in Palestine. Here are some of the different organizations that are involved and that have been brought on board. And I just want to say that in the case of all of these organizations here, the Danish Film Institute, University of Copenhagen, Loma Film, New Danish Screen, and so on and so forth. Everybody who is involved is involved because of solidarity. And they emphasize um, that word um, um, as opposed to politics. This is not, I mean, there's a very, very strong sense when you interview these people that they want to set aside the idea that this is part of a political agenda and they want to focus on a different kind of, of terminology. But people are bringing to the table whatever they think they might have to offer because there is the sense here of being able to do something meaningful with film, um, something that really matters.
Um, so the festival is run by um, Film Lab Palestine, an amazing multi-sited festival that, for example, connects Gaza to Ramallah um, through the simultaneous um, screening of, for example, this work here, Surface in, um, uh, of Gaza, um, and then a discussion on Skype between Gaza and um, audiences in Ramallah. Um, this is, um, you know, 800 um, school children of um, different religious um, uh, denominations coming to watch films. So the audience building. Um, solidarity. Um, here are the different people and organizations who have emphasized this idea of solidarity as being so tremendously important. And I've just put a few um, terms up here on the screen to signal the fact that, of course, uh, the literature on solidarity is vast and complicated. Um, but at the same time, I think we have an intuitive grasp of what might be at stake here. Um, and we come back to, I think, some of the issues that Rod and Gaston have already um, talked about. Um, typical statements. It's about giving people a voice. Um, the fact that it's Palestine is not an accident. Um, things like that. Um, last comments. Um, in terms of the production work that is done, many of the projects are twinned projects. So it's a model of talent development that involves putting two people together. Um, and then this is scaffolded and has to be scaffolded very carefully. And then with regard to this business of bi-directionality, uh, it's also typically a matter of thinking about how who gets to move. And so in the case of Film Lab Palestine, um, the movement initially is from Denmark um, to uh, Ramallah, and then in post-production it's from Ramallah to Denmark. And um, in terms of, for example, or Reitz here, who is um, uh, the person who oversees the twinning project or whose film workshop, one of the things that he will say is that, you know, this is really not about politics in uh, Ramallah because the issues are the same for me in Aarhus, where I'm out in the provinces um, and where the focus of the film workshop, again, is, a, is very much on giving people a voice. Um, so this tendency to try to sort of make a connection between issues at home and issues in the other context and um, the same is happening also from um, the Palestinian side. Um, my last point here, some of the different films, is that um, if you scaffold the project uh, for maximum ethical value, make sure that you really have it set up as a genuine partnership of equals and that you build bi-directionality in and so on and so forth, the aesthetic value of the works is enhanced. Um, and I'm going to point to this one film. Um, was not made through Film Lab Palestine, but was made by a Palestinian filmmaker, uh, Mahassan Nasser El Din, in collaboration with Camilla Margit, who's Danish, through um, the CPH uh, Docs Lab, which also works with the twinning model. And the reason I'm pointing you to this is because it's the same model as the one that the Film Lab Palestine is working with. But I um, interviewed uh, Mahassan and um, Camilla, and they really, really show us um, what happens in terms of artistic and cultural value if you get the context of production right in terms of ethical values. Um, so this idea that it's incredibly difficult to co-direct, you need um, trust and you need loads of conversation, lots and lots of talk, um, and you need to be able to articulate your own overarching conception to a degree that you not normally would be required to do. Um, and um, you have to think things through much more deliberately, much more explicitly, and so on. And it's not hard to see how these sorts of processes actually yield um, better works. So they point to things like clarity of concept, a much uh, better understanding of one's own artistic practices as some of the very beneficial outcomes of um, a twinned project within the context of transnational talent development. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Mette. Um, Rod and Gaston, would you mind joining us again at the front? Um, thank you for that, Mette. That was, um, I think it opens up some, some really interesting questions around what Rod was saying earlier around um, the, 
what he sees as the, I suppose, the depoliticization of, of um, film education in a certain, uh, certainly at the film school level, and a focus on craft, but a, a shift in emphasis that Meta is suggesting from um, talking about things pol in, in a politically and focusing more on an idea of solidarity. I suppose you could argue that you know, it, inevitably that becomes that there are political, you know, there's political decisions in there. But it's a question of emphasis, I think. I wonder though if we could. Um, if we could, maybe, Rod, do you want to start with, with, a, with a response to what, what Meta was saying there around this question of solidarity and how you think that might link to some of the things you were talking about around the... Sure. I mean, I think there's a, a, a much bigger and more interesting debate that we absolutely don't have time for about the relation of ethics and politics and how these uh, work together. If I remember rightly, Mark said he constructed a, 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 a view of the world from... It was, if I remember rightly, it was German philosophy, um, British economics, and French ethics, something like that. Um, and you know, the, these component parts come together. And I think the interesting thing that, because um, we obviously didn't um, confer a lot in advance, is that the same attitude in that quotation you ended with about working with, giving dignity to uh, a community without voice in Denmark is actually the same ethical approach to talking about collaborating in other parts of the world. And that's why I used examples from Pilton and Leith alongside uh, Aman and Wagadougou, because it's about a basis on which, uh, the word professional is a tricky one, but professional filmmakers, because of what it excludes and everything, but professional filmmakers collaborate with people who are not professionals but have something to say and find a way of agreeing the basis and the outcome of, of, of what is said, locally or internationally or in any direction. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I agree. There are these, um, these very striking um, similarities. And I, I, I too thought that it was um, um, very interesting that, that Owa wanted to pull the issues um, back home. And um, I think, you know, um, connecting also with Gaston's concluding remarks about um, the need to develop talent, you know, talent at home so that people want to stay at home. Um, you know, when Orais um, talks about um, there being a, a connection between the Danish context and then the one in, in Ramallah, he is um, thinking also, of course, about uh, what we in Denmark call um, New Danes. He's, he's, he's thinking about the fact that in Aarhus there is uh, precisely, uh, you know, uh, a, a place that is officially designated as a ghetto by the, by the government. And so um, his um, thought actually in terms of bi-directionality is um, to make sure that um, in the next phase of the development of this um, project based on solidarity, the Palestinian filmmakers will come to Denmark and they won't make the films about Danish realities and Danish stories at the workshop itself, which is in Aarhus, but they will make it in Gilorup, which is where um, there is a, um, a film workshop run by the Aarhus workshop precisely for new Danes, for immigrants, for refugees, and so on. So what he's trying to do is actually in the second phase of this transnational talent development project is to make the link um, uh, between uh, Palestine and then um, Palestinian communities in Denmark and so on and so forth. And, and so I think, you know, you, you start to see how um, these these very very small and modest projects, um, if they are carefully scaffolded and carefully thought through, have enormous ramifications, huge ramifications. Where suddenly, um, you know, if you point to the um, the level of soft power, people will say, Ah, yes, you know, this policy about engaging with the Middle East came right after the cartoon crisis, and so this is, you know, this is very much motivated by some of the issues that that you know were were very much on very distressing and disturbing um, to Denmark, in, including Danish industry at the at, at the time. Um, so, but you know, then when you look at what's actually sort of happening on the ground, um, there is an attempt to deal um, with some of the related um, realities, but to do so in a very very sort of productive way um, and in a way that builds um, um, communities and that also um, creates the basis for um, solidarity um, within um, not just on a transnational basis, but within a national community. Whoops. Um, so I think, yeah, 
there are lots of lots of issues here um, with regard to the politics of it all, lots of different layers. I'm sorry I went on too long. Gaston, if you could if you could respond to that as well, but also thinking we, we have an example here of transnational collaboration with Imagine because um, Rod and Meta have worked with you. But I wonder if, if you could also um, say a little bit more about that. It seems to me that, that that idea of transnational collaboration in order to allow local original voices, African voices to emerge is crucial in, in the, the philosophy um, of, of, um, of Imagine. Could you say a little bit more about that, please? Yes, we, we have uh, very uh, um, concretely uh, decided two years ago uh, not only to train people inside Imagine because we have uh, quite a nice infrastructure, but we decided to go in uh, five secondary cities of Burkina to train young people uh, locally because we wanted to give uh, uh, the possibility to know new voices to express you know so we trained them 60 people uh, at the beginning it was even 65 and then they ended being 47 people and they have told stories that no one of the filmmakers in Ouagadougou would have told you know because they were completely rooted in their reality and they spoke about environment, about uh, the, the, the clim climate change, uh, many stories about women that have uh, uh, become self-reliant, you know, while often it is spoken that uh, the, the women in Africa are completely, you know, armless in somehow, and we see some figures of women able to become uh, entrepreneurs and things like that. So to me, uh, the solidarity we are speaking about is, uh, um, it has a lot of uh, different levels and uh, uh, texture. I, I, I don't know how to, to say that in English. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I believe that, in fact, cinema and uh, the images are relevant to um, make people understand more uh, how they are interdependent, you know. Uh, that's very important uh, uh, to my eyes. And uh, what we are doing, for me, uh, most of the time people will ask, but what do you want the young people to make as movies? We say we don't tell them we, which type of movies they are going to do. We give them the capacity to make films, and we hope that they will tell the stories that they are, uh, you know, starving to say, you know. Uh, it's uh, it's that the the also the respect of their own uh, needs you know that's very important you know and at the beginning particularly because today it has become very difficult but we have trained people coming even from south africa from ethiopia nigeria zimbabwe uh, zambia and uh, of course, most of the Francophone countries uh, in West Africa and Central Africa. Today, we are concentrating more on uh, Burkina Bay uh, young people or those who are from uh, other countries but already living in Ouagadougou because uh, it has become very difficult to get the money to bring them for uh, such a long distance, you know. So to me, uh, uh, for instance, we have also created an exhibition called uh, The Gift of Africa to the World because we also uh, teach history in the same time. So when the kids come and they visit the exhibition, you can see how their faces change after because they only know Africa about problems, you know. And this time they, they are learning, of course, some uh, sad parts 
of the history of Africa and slavery, colonialization, and things like that. But also they see that Africa has uh, uh, achieved a lot of different things that they didn't know about, you know. They learn about uh, uh, Egypt, you know, the, 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 the very remote history of Egypt, uh, and uh, the, all the inventions in terms of in medicine, in uh, astronomy, in uh, mathematics, architecture, that were from Africa. So it gives them kind of self-confidence, you know, to, to say, okay, we like any other human being in the world, uh, there are some glorious parts of our history, other parts very difficult, but then we have to continue the, the, the way of building up uh, our, uh, our uh, own uh, destiny. Nobody will do it except ourselves, you know. And it passes through the real world, but also through the imagination, to the poetics and all those things. And uh, I, I, I think we, we have to, to tell them that they are not poor. They are not poor as usually it is told. They are rich of culture, of imagination, of uh, stories, and they have to invest that in their new lives, you know. We're going to pass out to the to the audience with some questions because I'm I'm conscious of time and I want I want the, to ex extend the discussion, but I'm sure there are other things that we can come back to. Do we have questions? So uh, first of all, thank you very much for those presentations, which I liked very much because they brought uh, this question of basically the political side of film education back to the table, which tends to be forgotten quite often. I think when it when we talk about film education, and I'm also I, I also tend to forget about it sometimes. So I like that very much, um, and I want to pick up on something um, that you said um, uh, later in the discussion with Marx, basically, and this uh, I, I wanted to follow up on this idea of the means of production because what you described in the beginning uh, that basically for example film schools are basically providing staff for uh, TV stations and so on and basically preparing people for the industry is something that I also see in the film schools I know but which is closely linked to this whole idea that film itself is always very close linked, uh, closely linked to an industry and that industry is interested in making money. So and if you look at the history of cinema most of the radical or many of the radical formations of filmmakers had to do with finding different means of production. Working with 16 millimeter or working totally independent like the new American cinema cinema, things like this. So I always, I have this more broad question of how do you deal with this idea of means of production? Because the way I see film schools working is really they follow basically this idea of having enormous equipment of being able to work with all of the softwares and all of the cameras and so on. And I wanted to hear from your rather political perspective on this idea of film education, which role you would put on these means of production. Well, it, uh, I'll actually, on uh, behalf of Gaston, tell about a little incident where um, at the School of Sound in London, uh, which is three days talking about sound and film, um, that happens every other year, uh, I did a, a, a kind of session with Gaston showing some extracts and asking Gaston how he used music, how he used sound. And it if I may say so, it seemed to go well. Mm -hmm. And then later on, on the second day, uh, Larry Side, who organized the School of Sound, said, you know, you realize that was like a hand grenade. I said, oh, how? And he said, well, because most of the young people who come to the School of Sound are from what he describes as the School of Walter Murch. You're a great sound designer, editor, uh, high tech, uh, 16, if you haven't got 32 tracks, digital manipulation, etc. And what emerged in talking to Gaston was one that, though you're not against technology, actually don't use it if you don't need it. Low technology can work perfectly well. 
Um, and secondly, a relationship to filmmaking, which is not true of most students from Europe and America, which is making film within a culture. And uh, you know, he used the phrase yesterday about, I need to make a film for my audience, meaning about connecting with a community, even though it's fictional production, which is a responsibility to a group. And that's, it seems to me, the politics of the film. And just to finish by saying, you know, Another set of discussion we haven't got time for is that, you know, the conjuncture at the moment is one of extreme polarization. I think we can all agree that, you know, the, the, the uh, right has gone off and the left has turned up and a moment of contention is what we're living within at the moment. And uh, I think the other aspect of this is something quite separate, which is different modes of production and distribution and reception because of the digital age. You use numeric, like they, you say numeric, but the digital world is where we have uh, some new possibilities. We have to adapt to them anyway, but how to intervene in uh, this moment of extreme contention. We're coming out of a kind of uh, calm period into a moment of contention, and um, I think filmmakers have to seize the possibilities of intervening in that. This takes us back to Edinburgh 1976. <laughs> Did you want to say anything, Gaston? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, um, at Imagine, the students are not paying nothing. For 15 years, they, they, they are educated for free. And I use it to say that the only thing they have to pay is their motivation and desire to, to learn, you know, and uh, how they, they let their own inventivity, audacity, and, uh, and craziness emerge. It's what we, we want to... to uh, to allow, to, to permit that it takes place in somehow. Yeah. Um, really wonderful um, question. Um, in the case that I'm looking at, um, so from the Danish side of things, there's been this big emphasis on creativity under constraint, turning constraints into something that actually um, is, is, is productive. Um, if you look at the people who've been involved in the um, Transnational Tal Talent Development Project, uh, Loma film, pocket film, um, films made on iPads, iPhones, um, the uh, consultant from New Danish Screen, who's the, um, uh, which is the talent development um, program within the context of the Danish Film Institute, Johnny Anderson goes out there with the whole sort of a uh, low budget um, film concept. Um, so this issue of um, having modest resources um, and 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 being absolutely and totally convinced that modest resources can yield something absolutely marvelous. Um, that is an, a, a, a such a powerful commitment here. And then I would add to that. Um, People, of course, you wouldn't want a project like this to have to remain always, you know, focused on the absolutely modest. So what I also see evidence of is this idea that um, on a case-by-case -case basis and when needed, there should be access to something that is uh, that is more elaborate. Um, so for example, um, in terms of post-production, color grading and so on and so forth, look, if we actually want something that has the kind of quality that we're, that we're after, we need to make sure that we at that point access the relevant facilities. So the networking that we're doing in connection with a project like this has to um, be focused also on accessing the right sort of equipment at the right time. Um, so I think, yeah, two elements to that. Focus on modesty, um, um, scarce resources, but that's not an impedit impediment to doing something important and then access via networks. Yeah. Just to add to that in the context of um, Moroccan cinema, I'm currently involved in a, a research project that focuses on Moroccan cinema and we've been looking at uh, film education, film schools, training, and the challenges for young emerging filmmakers and film students. And one of the things that comes up as well is in there's a similar situation in Morocco with a focus on um, on craft, on um, you know a small number of schools that are well equipped technically, with a focus on production facilities and post production. The thing that seems to get missed there is the importance of um, the development stage. The, the, the luxury of space and time 
to, to be able to develop these ideas, to allow them to, to emerge is something that I think is in, important within that as well, which can get lost in the sort of obsession with having the, you know, the, the state of the art facilities. And um, the, the other point there in relation to, um, to, to, to the, um, the original question around, around the, the, the political, and another thing that emerges in the, the work I've done in Morocco with speaking to you know, film students and also people who are involved in film education is a sense that it's not, that there is a, also a lack of, of, of space for um, not just a cinephilia, but an understanding of film culture, of a national film culture, um, and, and an ability to engage with that, again, at the development stage of often in terms of research and a real... Um, intellectual underpinning to to a project that um that sometimes is is missed so i think that that point of development is crucial and i think that's something that you you focus on at, at imagine as well gaston the, the the point of development and writing is that that's true yeah, yeah i think uh, maybe you you can answer even because you know uh, i mean um you know Because uh, normally when you want to establish a school, it takes a long process. And I didn't want to ask permission to anyone to do it. I didn't go to European, uh, um, you know, community to ask for money, neither to my, my uh, government to do that. So it came unexpectedly, you know, and we had to invent the, the, the way that we wanted to, to do this school. So we are completely flexible and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, I would say uh, I would like to be surprised myself by the way that it develops, you know. Imagine doesn't belong to me. I have been, uh, it, you know, uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, and and craft person to 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 bring it into life, but I don't want imagine to depend from myself my vision of cinema or life. I I try to share as uh, um, as widely as I can. Is the reason why we have uh, road coming. Uh, uh, Mete, but we have also people from Belgium, from Cameroon, from uh, US, uh, and so on. Because maybe there is one thing that I believe in is that uh, cinema is a nation. You know, I prefer it to an, uh, any other nation in the world, you know, because there is uh, room for everybody to bring. Uh, you know, commitment, imagination, and uh, uh, you, you spoke about polarization. If I understood, it was uh, how to, to make people more fecund, you know, by different uh, pollen coming from everywhere. It's, uh, it's what uh, I believe in. And I would say uh, just rapidly that to me, um, the stories that I, I expect to see from the young filmmakers, uh, I hope that it will, uh, it will um, give uh, uh, new strength to Africa, uh, and I believe to this, uh, this uh, 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 quest that is called African Renaissance. Mm. I don't know how exactly because it has to be invented. Uh, if we start defining it, it will be a wrong thing, you know. So it has to be, so we have to give the opportunity uh, to, to the youth to, to tell their stories, no matter what it is. They, they have to discover themselves throughout the stories that they are telling, you know. And I hope that uh, uh, we are going to bring, uh, as I said at the beginning, new aesthetics in film, as other uh, countries like Japan and uh, have uh, brought to the, 
the film culture in the world. I think Africa has uh, has to play its own uh, uh, part, you know, in uh, this uh, this construction, you know. I just wanted to say, um, if have you been introduced to the newsreels that have come out of Imagine? Have that being mentioned. So if you Google uh, FESPACO newsreels, um, these different newsreels produced by students um, as part of a training project at um, Gaston's Imagine will come up. Um, and these newsreels are, I think, absolutely extraordinary because you'll see Imagine, um, you'll see um, a scenes from that very exhibition that Gaston referred to. Um, you'll see that there's a conference focusing on African philosophy going on in the courtyard. You'll see that there's an opening of a visual um, arts exhibition on the other side of the school and so on and so forth. So I really think, you know, those 15 minute um, newsreels are, are, are really, really worth watching. And um, if you haven't been to FESVAC as well, you'll, you'll, you'll sort of see what that's all about as well. So I just want to share that. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we, we're going to have to wrap up. We're already over time, and I know that we have to stick to time for um, for the other sessions in respect for the, the the screenings and the students that are coming, and also because other people have to be away to uh, a very important uh, opening uh, event tonight. I'm sorry that there won't be time for more questions, but we can continue the discussion over coffee. So, could we just um, have a round of applause and show our appreciation for a fantastic time? So thank you, Rod, Gaston, and Mitch.